Good. I'll just pause it and I'll start it again. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jackson Hudecki and I'm the Bird Study Group Director for the Hamilton Naturalist Club. And I'd like to welcome you to our first night, our first of 10 in the year. I'm broadcasting to you from downtown Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, the city of Hamilton is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations. This land is covered by the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek to care and share for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the city of Hamilton is home to many indigenous people across Turtle Island, and we recognize that we must do more to learn about the rich history of the land so that we can better understand our role as residents, neighbors, partners, and caretakers in this 40 kilometer radius that we call the Hamilton study area. Um, I'm wearing my orange shirt tonight because we are in the month of uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which calls upon the federal government to establish a statutory holiday on September 30th. So I'm wearing this now. I'm, I'm, I'm early in that, but on September 30th, hopefully um, you'll don your orange shirt. Uh, as a former musician, I, I grabbed this from the Downey Wenjack website, um, but I've also been trying to catch up on the Hamilton Urban Indigenous Strategy. And there are, uh, there are plenty of, of ways that we can be working with and connecting with Indigenous communities. Orange Shirt Day is, of course, but one. Um, that said, welcome to, as I mentioned, night one. We're virtual still, and it's not that we're not trying to go in person because we are. The Hamilton Naturalist Club has been connecting with Royal Botanical Gardens to try and get these meetings back in person again. Um, previously, the BSG, the Bird Study Group, would meet at the Burlington Senior Center. And we heard from a lot of people that there were a lot of discrepancies with that building, mostly how to get there and lack of access to get there. People couldn't take buses. Students from college or university couldn't participate in, in any BSG meetings. So we're trying to centralize it into one location. And so we've been in meetings with Royal Botanical Gardens as it's kind of on the border. It's close to the center of the Hamilton study area. So we're getting there. We're working on it. You might see a fundraiser happen as a result of some of the conversations that are being had but when in doubt we've got zoom and frankly i'm coming off covid i had covid um last week and the week before for the first time since it came around and i'm not sure if you've had it but it is nasty uh, and i'm still suffering from it i'm not testing positive anymore just as of this weekend but for a good 10 days it rocked me and my wife and my kids so i hope everyone's staying healthy out there I'm really happy you're here. We've got 30 participants in the room so far tonight. Um, so I'm, I'm happy that you're all here uh, on night one. So we go from September until until May, hopefully. And again, we would love to transition to in-person meetings. We're going to try and maybe even do uh, swap it back and forth where we have monthly general meetings hosted by Lou Mitten of the Naturalist Club and the, and the president where it's a general meeting. And then the bird study group focus solely on birds um, and that's where we are tonight and we've got a special guest which i'll announce shortly but if you this is your first time with us and if it is let us know in the chat we like to keep our our mind on birds beyond what we're seeing and hearing in the field uh, we want to allow this to be a spot where we can have conversations about bird ecology bird threats uh, efforts by those in the community any sort of trends or predictions that are occurring i really do try and and cast the net wide to bring in a wide variety of speakers uh, we want to amplify the voices of people making a difference we want this to be a safe and inclusive spot for everybody but we want to bring the average person and the expert birder to the same spot we want everyone to learn something and we hope we're doing that tonight um, with our special guest but bird migration is in full swing we're seeing fall migration happen uh, the, we typically see shorebirds and warblers working their way through first. So the shorebler, shorblers, it's not a typo, um, 
are pushing through strong. So there have been a few sightings of Connecticut warbler and prairie warbler in the area, which is pretty great. Um, but you name it, everything else has kind of been around. Uh, we've seen w w myrtle, Wilsons, um, chestnut sided, um, black pole coming through, but also marbled godwit, wimbrel, red knot, um, coots paradise, valley in uh, windermere basin there's a lot of mud showing so where there's mud there is bound to be shorebirds um so that is great to know that they're pushing their way through um for some rare birds i've got a shot here by uh bob hermetz of the a uh, american white pelican that's been hanging around Coots Prairie. it's got to be like a month now that it's been on the uh, the dundas marsh so that's pretty cool uh, acadian flycatcher was seen recently big movements of broadwing hawks as of late even today I was seeing on Discord just late this afternoon um, that there were hundreds of broadwings flying over, a couple hundred flying over Greensville from Richard Port, uh, and Hamilton Cemetery had a good mix of broadwings, kestrels, and sharp shin hawks. Jaeger watches on. People have already been reporting Jaegers um, from either shore of either Burlington, Oakville, or in Hamilton around Confederation Park. Over 114 common night hawk were seen um by alvin buckley one day recently 114 in one in one sitting which is pretty incredible um but thinking back to the summer because we haven't met since may um little blue and yellow crown night heron were also a couple showstoppers but let us know what's been exciting for you this spring this summer mostly and this fall what has been exciting for you when it comes to migration let us know in the chat if it's been a lifer for you or a standout bird that you've seen this migration so far, uh, let us know. In fact, let us know what you're excited about. I was working on this presentation, and this was my slide from our last meeting in April. So we didn't do a May one, and then we did a meet and greet in June. Um, but there are some similarities there. The shorebirds, the warblers. Um, is, I just thought it'd be interesting, the, the broadwing hawks. So this was this was from back in, in April, and I just thought it was neat to see the comparison between April and September. So speaking of things that have happened in the past, um, many thanks to Mark Peck from the Royal Ontario Museum, who came down, and thanks to birds you've been saving for quite a while, because we haven't been able to connect with Mark since the pandemic began. This was the array of birds that were sent to the Royal Ontario Museum, courtesy of those who were finding dead birds in the field. Uh, Mark's been doing this for ages, coming down to Hamilton to collect birds from us. Um, and I, I forget, I think it was Dave from Wild Birds who was holding on to a great blue heron in a deep freezer. That must have been a big package in your deep freezer, but uh, quite an array of birds. Um, a friend of mine, Paul, shared recently um, the American Birding Association Code of Ethics. So you're here tonight, you're out in the field, you're representing the birding community, but you're also representing the earth. And so it's important to kind of remember what we're doing this for, right? It's important to know that we're doing this um, with the hopefully the scope of bird conservation uh, but protection is a huge thing so there are three basic ethics respect and promote birds in their environment respect and promote the birding community and its individual members and respect and promote the law and the rights of others Birding should be fun to help build a better future for birds, for birders, and for all people. Birds and birding opportunities are shared resources that should be open and accessible to all. Birders should always give back more than they take. And that's why we're here tonight. And that's why I'm here. And if you're looking to do more in the community, I've got a whole bunch of events coming up to share with you that you can take part in the, in the community. So back in April, we welcomed a few folks from the Feminist Bird Club, a chapter in Toronto, to tell us all about the FBC. And they're coming to Hamilton this Sunday from 11.30 to 10.30 at Bayfront Park. Uh, if you're looking to learn more, their Instagram page is great. So the Feminist Bird at the FBC.to on Instagram is a good uh, resource to check out, but you can go meet some folks from the FBC this Sunday. Um, I was reached out to by Bird Friendly City Hamilton Burlington, and they shared a couple things for us to note. 
So uh, the Global Bird Rescue from October 3rd to 9th is on, and they're looking for volunteers to kind of peruse the community um, to look for birds on the ground. So the Global Bird Rescue uh, happens globally, and if you would like to take part in this, you can reach out to birdfriendlycityhamburl at gmail.com. Even if you want to take part in the group, they're always looking for folks to join the committee, um, especially now that Hamilton and Burlington are both designated bird-friendly cities. They also wanted to just share that during migration, um, we, we want to keep the lights out. You're probably doing that anyway, but if you have a, a light that you keep on in the backyard, or if you notice at your business that there's a light on somewhere, really consider talking to somebody about turning that off, especially during migration, um, because that really can disorient birds as they're migrating for we know that millions of birds migrate at night the naturalist club has several events happening coming up um there's a tree planting happening at windermere basin on september 24th so that's this weekend um from 9 until 11 30 there's 300 native trees looking to be planted at windermere we'll have some shovels available but bring a shovel if you do have one or if you've got a favorite one um, the HNC, in collaboration with Environment Hamilton and the city's forestry department, is putting this on. 300 trees, that's a lot. We need your muscle power. So please consider uh, going to Windermere Basin this weekend, starting at 9 a.m. and until all the trees are in the ground. The following day, at one of the HNC's latest uh, property acquirings, the Sheila Dunduli Nature from the center of the Hamilton study area. So this is just off of kind of Snake Road. Um, there is a garbage cleanup. Now I know I've got an image of some goats here. So the goats have been doing their part, eating a whole bunch of invasive species. We need people to do their part by coming out and helping out the field and stream rescue team who are working with the HNC. They're gonna be going down, like down the ravine. This is a steep ravine. If you've driven past it and looked down it, um, this is steep. And this is one of the neatest reasons why acquiring this property was so important was because a lot of those hills are so steep, people haven't been on it. There's very minimal human disturbance um, in terms of soil compaction. Uh, so there is definitely some garbage that is blown down below. So if you can help out, that's this weekend from nine until noon at the Sheila Dunduli Nature Sanctuary. There is a Gorley Park Tree ID Walk. So if you're a West Mountain resident, or you've been around like the Garth Church area. This is kind of looking south. So Garth Street would, would be along this route here. Um, but this is, this, there's an incredible forest um, that is, is in, incredibly tall um, with a great array of, of, uh, of tree species. So the HNCs and RBGs, Charlie Briggs, will be taking a walk through this mature urban forest. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some activities that are happening in there, but it's a really amazing spot. Falkirk is nearby as well, so you can imagine this is a great migratory trap for warblers. Uh, so a really cool spot to check out on the West Mountain. So that's Wednesday, September 28th from 6 until 7 p.m. For all three of these events, if you want to know more, you can reach out to Jen uh, at land at hamiltonnature.org if you have any questions. Um, and then lastly, from the HNC, we're creating seed orchard beds at the York Boulevard Parkette. So, uh, Boulevard and Ray Street is over here and Pearl is over there. Um, we're looking to create some new pollinator habitat beds um, to add on to the nine that are there already. So um, that will be on October 15th from 10 until 12 a.m. So again, downtown Hamilton, really trying to bring biodiversity to the urban core, which would be great. Um, and so speaking of Jen Baker, she is going to be our uh, special guest at the general meeting happening on Monday, October 17th. This will be happening over Zoom. And it'll be the HNC's annual general meeting. So we'll be hosting that on Monday, October 17th, starting at 7.30. We'd love to have you. Um, you can bring questions you have about the club to that meeting, and you can learn a little bit about what's going on. Uh, I don't know if you've actually met our treasurer, Kevin, or maybe he shared some things last year. Maybe not, but it'd be really interesting for you to meet or hear about some of the activities that are happening behind the scenes with the Hamilton Naturalist Club.
some chronological order. Um, so October 24th is municipal elections across the province. And um, there's a really neat resource in Hamilton anyways. I don't know if it extends into the Halton region. So if you're tuning in from Oakville or Burlington, uh, Milton, you might not have the same resource, but around Hamilton, I elect Hamilton.ca is a really cool spot to learn a little bit about the candidates in each ward as well as the mayor. Are they nature focused? Are they bird friendly? These are questions that you can be talking to candidates about um, when you're considering voting for them or if they come to your door. I know there have been some debates that have been happening on Cable 14, and I know that luckily in Ward 1, uh, the incumbent Maureen Wilson is really nature focused. Um, so, um, and she's keen to answer a lot of questions and she's been keeping a good track of what's been going on. So talk to who's running, think about who's running in your ward and think about if they have the environment, nature, birds, conservation, biodiversity in the forefront of their mind or in their platform, especially when it comes to the mayor, especially. Um, but regardless of that, are you a member of the HNC? We'd love to have you as part of the club, uh, $50 a year for an annual membership is uh it goes a long way it definitely goes a long way to support jen to support her coordinator Brittany, um to support the club and all its endeavors especially as we're looking to acquire more property but even just maintaining the property that we have for we know that what we do have all the sanctuaries we have are to be protected for life so uh, becoming a member goes to a good cause you're supporting something great in the region when you think about how can you make a difference in this corner of the world being members of organizations like this is a huge step. Um, and then you get a copy of the Wood Duck. And you can participate in a myriad of ways. We'd love to have you. The more people, the better. We need more eyes and ears um, out in the nature world. And that being said, I haven't checked this evening, um, but we are mere people away from crossing over the 3,000 person threshold for the Hamilton Nature account on Instagram. I know I've been talking a lot about Instagram tonight. Um, so if you're on it, great. Yep, 2,996 still. Let's see if tonight we can push that into the 3,000 mark. We'd love to have you on our social media accounts so you can learn a little bit more about what's going on with the HNC. I'm not gonna cover too much about what's going on here because we're gonna learn a little bit about, a little more about that with our special guest tonight. But there are a plethora of resources to get started in the birding community in the Hamilton Burlington area, um, Facebook, so social media, Discord, Rob Porter hosts the Songbirding podcast and he's our special guest tonight. Um, but there are Google groups um, and then there are clubs. There are a variety of different clubs, the Pippets, the Larks. I know RBG and the Hamilton Conservation Authority um, hosts regular birding outings, the Feminist Bird Club I mentioned earlier. So if you're looking to get started, there are lots of ways to get involved in the community. And if you wanna, if you wanna share a project, if you want us to talk about stuff, if you want to share it in the Wood Duck on social media at these BSG meetings, um, let me know. Reach out. Bird City. Give me in the chat tonight. Um, let us know how we can promote birding in your community or your efforts. And if you know somebody who would be an interesting speaker who can talk about a project, who can, who is devoting parts of their life to this world. They could be a special guest. We're building, um, we're building out all of our special guest speakers from now until, until May. Uh, so let us know if you know somebody or send them to me and I can get that conversation going. But again, we just want to keep getting the word out there of what's going on and who's doing what. So lastly, our next BSG meeting, our next bird study group meeting is the night of the election. So we can talk all about it that night on Monday, October 24th at 7.30 is going to be our special guest. So this year, Bob and his partner, Glenda Slesser, took a trip from Hamilton um, to Vancouver. So Burlington to Vancouver and back. Their quest was to see Western Canada and all its natural splendor of mountains, prairies and coasts. Oh, and they wanted to see new Canada birds and all the other animals and plants that they could encounter. We could join them on their quest um, and talk to Bob and learn from him and Glenda, uh, not just about their trip, but about what's been going on with them and birding in the Hamilton area. Um, so look forward to that in our October meeting. We haven't done kind of a trip focused meeting in a while, but when it's Bob Curry, you say yes. So I'm looking forward to, to hanging out with him next month and hopefully you'll be here too. 
But let's get to tonight. So Rob Porter is our special guest, and he's going to be talking to us about the wide world of birding. So we've put this description out there. Birding has changed a lot in the last couple of decades with both new tools and new approaches to the hobby and to the study of birds. Tonight, we're going to start from the absolute basics of birding and talk about the tools and resources that help you on your birding journey, as well as survey a wide variety of niches that have emerged in the birding world. Take a deep dive into a couple of those niches by looking under the hood of the new Merlin Sound ID app, which everybody talks about, um, maybe to their detriment sometimes, who knows? Um, so um, we'll learn a bit about that and then talk about the Eastern Bluebird Trails and if time allows and if it doesn't, we promise to bring Rob back to talk a little bit about the Hamilton Christmas bird count data. So whether you're completely new to birding or a veteran tonight, hopefully you learned something new. Rob is a naturalist and a software engineer based out of Hamilton. He is the host and producer of the Songbirding podcast, which can be described as interpreted audio tours of songbird territories, which currently has over 130 episodes at an average of 20 minutes of length at over 50 hours of educational and relaxing soundscapes. He is the director at large with the Hamilton Naturals Club, collaborate, blah, 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 collaborates with other members of the club with the Hamilton Bioacoustics Research Project. I'm so excited to have Rob here tonight. So without further ado, Rob Porter, welcome. Take it away, my friend. And at any time, ask questions in the chat, put them in the Q&A, and we'll be sure to get to it before the end of the night. Thanks so much, Rob. Over to you. All right. So I'm just going to set up all my technical things here. Let's go to our presentation thing, and then I need to go over here. Content, share sound. All right. We should be looking at the, the right stuff now. Slide show. And I have my webcam there, so I'm hiding up here. All right. Let me know if that's all working on your art. Yeah, it's looking good. I actually had something muted, but now I'm good. All right, you might have been hearing me, but I'm also broadcasting this on live stream on my Twitch channel, which now they should be able to hear that. Um, <laughs> yeah, somebody was just yelling mute on there. We're good now. Um, so yeah, my name's Rob. I'm director at large of the Hamilton Naturals Club. I've presented here a few times. Um, my apologies if some of this seems a little rushed in the sense of like thrown together quickly, because we did have to... Um, we, I believe we had a cancellation or something like that. And I had to throw this together in the last couple of weeks based on an idea I had of, um, you know, what can we do? What can I throw together that would be interesting to everyone that wasn't like a rehash of what I've done already. Um, one of the things I thought though, was as the bird studies group, I haven't really seen any presentations that were just like, what is some of the basics of birding and what are some of the broad, what's in the broad spectrum of birding out there? What kind of things can one do and still be considered a bird or, um, and there's an awful lot these days. Um, one thing I did miss in my presentation, I realized that Jackson covered, thankfully, were things like the pipits, um, small groups like that, um, beginner birder groups. That's a huge resource when you're beginning birding. So um, thanks for covering that, Jackson. And um, yeah, I'm going to go through here. There is a URL to the slides right here, tiny.cc slash wide world of birding. Hopefully that dog barking isn't distracting. I their neighbor's dog barks a lot. Um, and um, the reason I put that there is in case you want to catch any of the URLs I put in here, um, because I wasn't sure whether to see if I could go get the HNC page updated. I thought that would be rather lengthy. It'd just be better to give you all a link to the presentation so you can just go through and see it at your own pace in the future and take a look at links and all that kind of stuff. So that is there. That URL will be there at the end as well, too. Um, so my goal in this presentation is we are going to Hopefully, um, everyone's going to learn something new, basically. I'm hope hoping there's something for everyone in here, no matter how much birding you've done. Um, I'm going from the absolute basics. Um, you can read on there what the definition um, is. Um, so I went to Wikipedia. They basically, you know, study of birds using either the naked eye or optics, listening, remote viewing. But I'm going to add a little bit to that, things like studying the accounts or encounters with birds. Um, so like written accounts, recorded, filmed, photographed accounts, um, audio recorded, of course, um, or creation of works involving the above artwork, um, for leisure or educational purposes. Anybody who is, um, creating resources to help others in their birding journey, I would consider that kind of in the, within that broad spectrum. Um, 
So a lot of things will be kind of surfacey in this presentation, just a heads up. There may be things I fly through um, just because of the time. There is a lot <laughs> out there um, and there's probably things I'm missing. I even will leave some time at the end if someone wants to throw in chat something I missed that would be an interesting thing to add. Let's do that. Um, a lot of this is also comes from my own, what do I wish I knew before? Um, I grew up not even knowing birding was really a thing. I'm pretty sure for the longest time, I thought it was one of these things that people travel to do. You go to other countries, you go to South America, you go to Central America, you go where all the nature documentaries say you go, um, that kind of thing. That was my, in my head for what birding was. Um, had I encountered a naturalist club um, in, my, in my youth, maybe I would know differently. Um, but um, it was for me, it was mostly in scouts, um, that kind of system that was more wildlife survival and, you know, that kind of stuff, so camping and so on. So I didn't really have a, a way into the birding world until much later. All right. So let's go through the different kinds of birding that is out there. So if you want to bird by binoculars, that's like the thing everybody thinks of when they're thinking of birding. Um, there's a lot here. I'm not going to go too far over it other than to say eight by eight by 42 tends to be the standard glass. Some people like the 10 buys because you get a little closer in, but the problem then is you need to be better at spotting your birds. Um, but the main thing I want as a takeaway here, if you haven't bought your binoculars yet, or if you're thinking about new ones and things like that is two things. One, beware of very cheap binoculars. They will just make you hate birding probably more than enjoy it because they're going to be very frustrating to work with. Um, so be careful of that, you know, maybe prefer used over super cheap. Uh, the other is get a good harness strap rather than neck strap. So many years I was using a neck strap. And it was always wearing down the back of my neck. I, you know, after an hour or so, I'd just be like, oh, this thing is, you know, it's light at first, but after a while, it gets pretty heavy. Harnesses, um, I looked up today, around 30 Canadian is what they're at. They used to be 20, so I guess inflation, et cetera. But uh, well worth it. Um, they take all the weight from your neck, put it to your chest instead, where you can handle a lot more weight. All right, obviously, photography is a huge thing in birding. Um, so the way I went through photography, and this is kind of actually somewhat how I got into birding, was that I had a good digital, good for the time, digital camera that could do four times zoom, which is not anything today. Like your, your, your phone could probably do that. But I was taking some photos of pine siskins and going, oh, I wonder what these are, because it's just very blurry, grainy photo, because it was four times optical zoom, which was then bumped up to 16 times digital, which means it goes old kind of pixely and stuff, but I was a little super interested because I thought pine siskins were kind of a North thing. Like, oh, I'm not going to see those because I saw them a bit growing up on the farm, but I'm not going to see them down in Hamilton, but you no, know, it turns out you do. Um, I, you know, there's a little bit on here about like, if you're lower budget, you can go with a super zoom, but that's not the only reason to go that way. Um, the other reason, and this is why I stick with super zoom is because I can put it in a pack on the side and just ignore it. If I never want to take photos that day, it's fine. I'm carrying around a small camera. If you're carrying around a DSLR, if it, a mirrorless though, that is strapped to you, you are carrying it. Um, it is a thing that is, you're going to have to manage in some way because you don't want to break it. Don't want to damage it. It's not really something you can stuff away very easily. I mean, you can get packs for it and stuff like that backpack. Um, but generally if you're carrying around DSLR, or mirrorless, you're, you're out to do photo, photography generally. Um, and that's perfectly fine. That's birding as well. I'm just giving that warning. Um, so then in this case, the lower budget is actually a pretty good route because you can get the best of both worlds in that you can see things at a far distance, a little lower quality perhaps, um, but lower price. You can get to see if it's for you. You can see if, if photography is even for you. Um, you can get record photos. So I mentioned this in here, there's record photos. That's the concept of just taking photos to see what you saw. It's not meant to be artistic or anything special that you're going to be framing on the wall, but rather just what was that bird? Here's proof of this bird I saw. That kind of thing is what it is. And I mentioned here in a pinch, you could always do a smartphone plus a digiscope mount plus optics. So binoculars or scope tied to your smartphone can also do um, uh, I went from various Canon, I list here what various Canon models and Panasonics I went through in case you're curious. So you can review the slide later if you're curious about those kinds of things. Burning by ear, and this is the thing I'm highly into. So 
there'll be a little more about that probably in his presentation at various points. No equipment necessary. You hear the bird, you know what it is. Generally, sometimes there's cryptic species, but in general, that works really well. Um, I have done previous presentations to this, so I won't rehash too deeply. But my um, way of saying, you know, how you learn stuff like this is repetition, but not incessantly. Um, so um, years ago, there was an example of listening to songs on a loop on a CD. That can be okay to learn one species, but then when you start doing multiple, they're just going to mix up, get mixed up in your head pretty well. Um, you need some stories, you need some context, you need some narrative behind what you're hearing. Um, if there's only one song you memorize from CDs, then yeah, you're going to remember that song. So you're like, oh, well, that's that CD bird um, or from that MP3 or from that website, that kind of thing. But um, there are memory techniques people use to memorize numbers, for example. I think one example I thought of today are those people who competitively memorize the value of pi down to like 50 numbers or something like that. And the way they tend to memorize these things is to string together a narrative like, oh, there are three monkeys in one tree with four pies or something like that. And that's 3.14. And when you have a story like that, your brain saves it very differently than if you just thought three, one, four, that kind of thing. And um, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that, um, helps you memorize. So when you're out and you hear a bird and you're like, I don't know what that bird is. And you go chase it down and you're like, oh, that's a blue jay. You're storing that memory of that bird sound in your mind a little differently, especially if you do it multiple times to the point that it's just like, oh yeah, blue jay, no problem. Um, and the, uh, what was it? One of the examples I was thinking of was like, I had this in the previous presentation where I said, you know, this is the reason that you can tell the difference between, oh, a lawnmower is, you know, rattling on next door or a motorcycle uh, is rattling on next door. You can tell the difference because you've just learned it. You haven't intentionally gone, oh, I know what that motor is. <laughs> it's just something you learn because over time you've been like, that's the lawnmower. That's the chainsaw. That's the mo uh, motorcycle. So that kind of stuff uh, helps you learn what you're hearing and understand, turn it into a narrative. And then suddenly you're now identifying chickadees and bluebirds and uh, warblers and things like that over time. This is why, by the way, warblers are so difficult sometimes uh, because there's only in this region here, a lot of them just pass through um, singing once a year, uh, pass through as migrants and they're gone. That's a small window. Some of them are singing here in breeding territory as well. So that's a bigger window, maybe three, four months, but there's another eight months you're not hearing them at all. So is that repetition is kind of missing for a while. And then eight months, you know, later you're like, oh, what was that warbler again? So that's, that's part of why the warblers are so difficult. Um, so recording your outings, like when you go out and you take an audio recorder, that helps so much. Um, because what you can do is review later. You could say to yourself in the recording, I think this is this species. And you can check yourself later on that. That's a really good way of learning it. And you can upload your audio in places, but I'll get to that later. Um, Birding by scope is something I don't do very much, but here's some resources on it. Um, this is for things like lake watching, shorebird watching, a lot more. Um, they can range, just like binoculars, very inexpensive to very expensive, but Audubon is a great guide to this. Um, one of their key points, though, is beware of the cheap scopes. This is, again, a, a theme here, because they are literally going to give you headaches. Like, the bad optics will actually give you a headache, and you're going to hate it. Um, so, you know, no scope is better than a bad scope <laughs> to some extent. Um, so digiscoping is also a thing. So you can get uh, mounts for scopes so that you can actually put the scope up against your iPhone, Android phone, and record what you're seeing or even broadcast what you're seeing. I'll get to, the, get to that later. Um, so there's all kinds of things you can do with a scope at that level as well, too. So audio recording is another thing. This is another form of birding. You can go out and record birds. I do this all the time. Uh, recording birds and nature sounds. Um, it, when you're getting into this, gear can be pretty important, but it's actually not that high of a bar of entry cost-wise. I give the example here of the H1N. It goes between $100 and $200 Canadian. Um, it's not that much um, for a, well, in my opinion, a fairly professional recorder. There are, of course, better ones out there that will get you a little extra features and stuff like that. But this one, you know, people are going to think your stuff is really, really good when you record it on this. Um, and uh, as long as you do it, you know, 24 bit wave files and things like that. But these are things you can Google um, more of my 
intention in this presentation to say this is a thing you can do and be birding. Um, and if you're interested in this, you can come back to the slide, take a look, see what I'm saying. Maybe you can contact me or throw a question in chat. All right, automated recording units. So you can record in the field and not even be there. This is something that Hamilton Bioacoustic Project does. Here's some models, AudioMoth. It's an open acoustic devices. That, um, that's the name of the company, but it's actually literally open source hardware. So you can download the schematics and send those schematics to a manufacturing facility and they can build them for you. They don't have patents and things like that. It's just, um, it's meant for research purposes. So they've opened up the uh, schematics and everything. So you can make your own if you want. Um, it's probably easier to go with their group buys. They have uh, occasional group buys where people basically opt in and say, yeah, I'll buy five. And once they have an order of 500, they just send it off to the manufacturing facility. And three months later, you get your audio moth. That, that, that tends to be their model. And then there's the Swift and the newest Swift One, which is from Cornell uh, University, the Lab of Ornithology. Um, that's a the one on the bottom left in the presentation here. Um, we actually have one that looks different. That We have two of them that look like this one. And then we have several, that look, um, three or four that look like Pelican cases. And those are actually the better ones to get. Um, the Pelican case ones are the ruggedized, which means um, they're hardened to the elements. Better for use in Canada because of the cold weather in the winter. Um, this Swift model is not very well insulated. Uh, alkaline batteries die at negative 17 Celsius, which is right where an ice... Uh, salt water freezes basically it's the zero fahrenheit level um but we found that our ruggedized ones can last a negative 35 at least we don't know how much further they can go but at least negative 35 they have survived um celsius um there are commercial products out there such as song meter um haiku box um is a new one haiku box is actually interesting i only just learned about this one this one is a com um, uh, consumer grade stuff so this is something you could get for your backyard um, and it's meant to, you set it up and it'll, it'll give you notifications of what birds every day you're hearing in your backyard. Um, so it's meant to be on a Wi-Fi kind of connection and to tell you what you're hearing. Uh, so that one's a neat one. And just a touch about the future of this kind of stuff. AudioMoth are working on a thing called MicroMoth. It's that little U symbol. Um, it's only 33 by 24 millimeters. Um, so it's absolutely tiny. I feel like that in a few years, there might be like a viable solution of putting these things on drones and deploying them in remote areas where people just can't get to very easily. Um, the AI and stuff like that would have to get better, uh, but I think that could be a viable thing where you could send um, via drone some of these recording devices out to places so you can find out what breeding territories are out there. So I think that might be a thing someday. Uh, if it isn't already, I mean, I know, I know that there are some ecologists that are doing this on the larger scale where they're deploying audio moths by helicopter, but that's way more expensive, of course. Um, so hopefully I'm not rushing too much, but there's a lot of different birding out there. This is another audio one, nocturnal flight counting. And I know there's people in the Hamilton study area that have done this in the past. I don't know if there's anyone currently active in this. I haven't done too much in this lately. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but the idea is you're basically pointing a microphone up at the sky at night and recording the sounds you hear. You'd be surprised how often things end up being recorded. They're usually little blips, and these are some examples from an old um, journal uh, that I lifted from online. But um, you can basically look at these spectrographs in uh, your audio editing program and determine either a species or a group of species of the bird that flew over. And this is, um, you can look up more on this Lycos Bird website because uh, the old bird recorder is one that you can build yourself if you're okay with a little bit of soldering, or you can order from um, the guy who has this website. I can't remember his name, but he calls the recorder an old bird. It's uh, basically a bucket with a dish inside it and then a little microphone and um, some wiring is essentially what it is. Um, so it's pretty neat. There's a lot of people who do this kind of stuff uh, around the world, but I don't know how many people locally do this. Um, there's also remote cameras, and I'll get to this a little later as well, too, about um, some more innovation in this realm in the last few years. But uh, for example, there's no shortage of webcams online, live streams of feeders. Um, there's the Ontario Feeder Watch Cam, which tends to be a very popular one. That's been around for a few years now during Feeder Watch, but they're only active in November through April. 
Um, you can search YouTube live for live feeder cam. There's a ton of them out there. Uh, if you have a smart TV, you can leave it running because YouTube does support 4K. So you can get the 4K stream of someone's um, bird feeder. You can also search twitch.tv. Now Twitch is typically, uh, it historically was a gaming site, but it turned into more uh, lately more music. And now they've, in the last few years, they've allowed what are called unattended streams, which is basically means um, webcams of feeders, zoos, uh, things like that are allowed now. Um, so there are, there's a rise, rise of bird feeder and backyard cams now, and you can search these terms on Twitch to find that. And what you'll find the difference between the two are is that YouTube, you're going to get the higher quality audio and video, but you're probably going to get zero community out of it. You're just going to be watching a feed Twitch TV. You're going to also have a chat community attached to that, um, feeder or a backyard cam um, because it's just much more interactive there. There's there's more people actually actively chatting and stuff like that. So if that's interesting to you, that might be more interesting to you. Uh, so also, I mentioned here trail cams. We have used this sometimes with the club where um, this is usually more for finding uh, mammals, deer, things like that. But you can catch turkeys and larger birds on trail cams once in a while if you place them correctly. Um, Generally, only larger birds are you going to get on a trail cam, though. Um, and these are the kinds of things you put out there and you go retrieve later and see what's on the SD card, see what kind of photos were taken of it to see what triggered it. But generally, you're going to get more mammals than birds, probably. Bird surveys. So this is another type of birding you can do. You do a lot of bird surveys. Um, Jackson mentioned earlier, Christmas bird camp. That's a huge thing around North America. It's been going for 122 years now, I think. Um, the one here in Hamilton's been going about 101 years now, I think. And, um, so that's a huge thing. Ontario breeding bird survey is currently on and it's a, every 20 years, there's a five-year survey of checking all the quadrants of Ontario, which is a gigantic province, of course. So that's a huge undertaking to do. There are many provinces and states that do this as well, too. Um, I, I think you, I did, I have a hard time naming a state or province that didn't do these. Uh, it's just how often they do them for how long they do them as well. So if you're ever interested in travel, uh, I know there are some people from the club who have done the Manitoba breeding bird survey, for example. Um, so there, there's a lot of options out there if you want to do some travel. Um, Niagara Pencil Hot Hawk Watch, that's every March through May. You can stand out at Grimsby and look at the sky and watch hawks going by and count them. Um, it's a really neat experience. It's been somewhat disrupted by COVID, of course. Uh, but hoping that gets um, going full bore again soon. Um, there's other hawk watches like Hawk Cliff in Detroit River. Um, they do them as well, except they do autumn. Um, this fall, though, would be the Allen Warrington Fall Bird Count again. That's always the first Sunday in November. Um, every February, there's the Great Backyard Bird Count, and that's run by Cornell, I believe. eBird um, is the main venue for that. Also Global Big Day, which might be the Audubon, I can't remember, Global Bird Weekend, and I can't remember the org behind that, but that's coming up second weekend of October. Project Feeder Watch, November through April. Um, that's the one where you sign up with Birds Canada uh, in Canada and in the U.S., I believe it's the Audubon, and oh, no, it's Cornell, it's Cornell in the U.S., and you get, you basically get this whole package and you fill in what birds you see at your feeder every day, um, submitted basically for scientific study. Um, Lake Ontario midwinter waterfall count. That's a huge um, mouthful. So we usually call it the duck count, but it is the second Sunday every January. Um, and this is where you um, brave souls who do this. I used to do this, but I haven't lately just because Chris's bird count. Because I'm coordinator, I'm usually pretty burned out by the end of that. Um, you brave the cold, cold winds of Lake Ontario <laughs> in the winter and go out to count ducks um, through scopes and so on in various points of Lake Ontario. IBA counts, there hasn't been one, um, well, there hasn't been one for Dunnes Valley in a while. I think the West End Lake Ontario one is still going though every winter. So um, that is uh, something that's involved in the IBA, meaning important bird areas. Um, it's a means of surveying those areas to more or less see if they are, um, see how they're doing. Uh, important bird areas are specified based on criteria such as, you know, having 1% of the world's population of a particular species dependent on that region, or, you know, breeding of rare species, things like that um, is what determines an IBA. So those are very important. The RBG has their long watch. You can go to longwatch.ca to learn more about that. I'll actually talk a little more about that after. 
One more far, form of birding. There's a lot of forms of birding. Competitive birding. Probably heard about this. A lot of people in this club are involved with this. Doing big years, doing big days. Um, eBird, they keep their public top 100 list of most species seen ever or by year, broken down by region. I'll cover eBird later in the tools section, but um, that's basically a thing there. Here's a little bit of an example of what's going on in Ontario right now as of like yesterday, I think. Um, with Kaya sitting there at the top for this year's count of 342 species this year in Ontario. Such a big number. Wow. Um, and then the Great Canadian Bird Birdathon, for example, that's an example of kind of competitive birding as a charity. Um, you do a big day event in May each year. I think they've they've made it flexible for COVID. Um, their language said May this year, but I think people are doing them anytime. And I don't think they really care that much if you do it outside of May. Um, but um, the idea is you just set aside a day, uh, you raise some money saying, hey, um, you know, will you donate to this cause uh, if I go birding for the entire day and see how many species I can get? Patch birding. So this is something uh, I've done a lot. A lot of people in the club have done. This is the idea of you basically have spots that you are regular at. You go and you check them all year round. Um, uh, eBird actually has support for adding hotspots as patches. So you may consider the patch to be a quote unquote hotspot, like one spot. Like I go to McMahon. I, I haven't done it a lot this year, but I want to no, I didn't spell it wrong, um, but I used to go to McMaster Forest a ton, and that was kind of my patch. It's only one eBird hotspot, but someone else might be, well, Dundas Valley is more of my patch, and that's a lot of eBird hotspots. So eBird does have support for putting a whole bunch of hotspots together and saying, yeah, I'm going to add together your data from all those places to tell you how many birds uh, species you've seen there over the years or this year, that kind of thing. Um, hotspots, here's a neat thing, and this is something I'll talk about in a bit. They have bar charts that can show where data is lacking. And this is something that actually drove me to do a lot of birding in certain areas where I was looking at eBird going, well, nobody's ever submitted something in the second week of October, for example. So why don't I go out there in the second week of October and see what's there? And that'll fill in a little bit of this graph to see what kind of species are showing up then. Um, chasing rarities. This is a huge thing, also known as twit twitching. That, that term is more used in the UK, but I do hear it here once in a while. And listing as well, too. So there is a Discord for the Ontario Ray Bird Alert. Um, I mentioned later in my tool section about how to get to these Discord things. Um, Canadian Listers Corner, it's a long URL, so I put it here so that you can, you know, look at the presentation, click the link, that kind of thing later. Um, that's a published PDF, kind of more old school kind of way that you just email in what your list, you know, how many birds you've seen total for your life and you just keep it going. And it actually shows, here's an example here from the Ontario Life List in the 2021 edition. You'll notice here, Bob Curry was just mentioned. He's top of the list for Ontario, 447 species in his life. So uh, followed by Hugh Curry and then Keith Bark, Burke and Bill Lindley. Um, there's the Hamilton Birders Google group. Easier just to Google that, but um, to find it rather than put a big giant link in here. Uh, and eBird alert. So eBird, when you use it, and I'll get to that later, how to use that, um, you can sign up for alerts to say, let me know when there's rarities or let me know when there's a bird report in the region that I haven't seen. So it's a couple options you have there. Explorational birding. This is something I've done a ton. This is where you go out and find places that nobody else has gone to or nobody's gone to in a while. So hotspots gone cold, significant data gaps. As I mentioned earlier, you look at those bar charts, you go, there's all these gray places on it. Why don't I go in there and fill those in? There are some places you can just go and there's no hotspot whatsoever on eBird. And yet there are, of course, birds there. So you can create one. You can create one and you can just flag it in the eBird system as a, hot, as a proposed hotspot. If it's accessible to the public, they should approve it. Um, you could also spend a few days just filling in a hotspot list. Um, that can be really satisfying, just getting a list for a place that didn't have anything or that maybe somebody made two lists 10 years ago and then never came back. Um, eBird also has, and this is the example I have here on the screenshot, illustrated checklist as an option to hotspot, which is neat because when the hotspot is filled up, now you can you have more you can do, which is contribute photos of birds in this area, contribute audio of birds in this area. I'm sure they're going to add video at some point as well, too, because they are testing that for eBird right now. So explorational birding can be really fun. 
here's something completely new and I'd be surprised if anybody's heard of anyone doing this much infrared birding. This is very new. I mean, a lot of people have been testing and trying this for over the years, but it's an expensive endeavor. So um, lately, um, one of the people I know through Twitch, Ian Davies, um, has been showing on some of his uh, streams earlier this year, some photos and video he took through a very expensive um, model of um, infrared recorder called the Pulsar Helion 2. Um, now, these are pricey little things. I looked it up. It's about 5,300 Canadian for one. Um, but this is one where he's, you know, he's a project coordinator for eBird. And he said, this thing's good. Um, you can see thrushes under the under, you know, under shrubs. You can see warblers amongst leaves where you wouldn't be able to see them otherwise. Um, you can spot all kinds of things you wouldn't be able to spot otherwise. It's really neat to look at the photos he had of it. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any of his streams that were saved that had that um, examples or I would use them. This photo here is an example from the UK. Um, someone taking a photo of a jack snipe, I believe. There are a lot of cheaper models out there that you can spend hundreds or low thousands on. But they often have limited range and ability. They might be um, low frame rate, for example. They might only update the picture every once every second. Uh, they might just not be sensitive enough. They might even be able to zoom far enough in for it to be worth anything. Uh, that's because a lot of low end model is more for hunting, big game, that kind of stuff. There's a lot of overlap in optics between hunting and birding. So that's why a lot of those things are out there. Whereas this one is very, it's not designed for birding, that's for sure, but it is. Um, I, I think it, it, I, I believe these are probably like military is why they came about, um, uh, to be frank, but it's interesting. And I think give this a few years, let some used ones get on the model, uh, or, sorry, you let some used models get on the market and there might be more people doing this. So this is one of the more interesting ones. Um, that said, if you're doing infrared, you might think of, oh, well, owling, you can look at bowels. Yes, you can do that with the infrared probably find owls pretty easily with that. Um, but for those of us who, you know, aren't going to spend that much on something, um, nocturnal birding is a big birding by, by ear activity. Um, owls, by the way, though, are very frequent, infrequent vocalizers to our automated recording unit. So we set out an automated recording unit. There are some nights where they don't vocalize, other nights when they do. So if you go out owling, you get nothing. Even if you were just a recorder in the woods, you may not catch anything that night. Like that's the reality of this. Um, so expect a lot of quiet nights, expect some disappointment when looking for it. So I say it pairs well with stargazing because um, owling, if you do get frustrated easily, not finding things like that, you should have a secondary goal in mind as well. So stargazing is an example of something you could be doing. I also mentioned the top here, woodcock, snipe, whippoorwill. Uh, of course, whippoorwill are more or less expert, expert, Extirpated, uh, expirated. Yeah, I'm losing terminology there. Extirpated. That's what expert extirpated from the HSA, more or less, except during the brief uh, migrational window. Um, but uh, you could travel a couple hours north, uh, probably find some uh, snipe and woodcock are readily in the area in spring. So that's something you could also go out to listen to. Um, long sit, long watch, long listen. I mentioned the long watch on here before. So this is another thing you can do. I mentioned this site here, BirdAbility. I would love it if some, you know, if somebody's looking for a little volunteer project, this website allows you to contribute to it places that people of various mobilities can use. Um, so if you're in a wheelchair, can you use this? If you can walk, but only a limited amount, can you go to this hotspot, that hotspot? There isn't anything in the Hamilton area listed there right now. There's a couple of Toronto things and a Kitchener thing I noticed. So um, this site could use some contributions. Um, because this is a very accessible form of birding. So blue birding nesting boxes, I noticed the time is running low, so I'm not going to get too deep into this, but this is something I do as well. Um, Eastern Ontario, uh, sorry, the Eastern bluebird in Ontario, very highly dependent on human assistance. Bird box, via bird boxes, basically. Um, Hamilton has a lot of blue, bluebird trails, but they're not necessarily well documented where they are, uh, who's maintaining what. Um, so here's a project idea for someone looking for it out there, creating a registry of bluebird trails or just documenting it somehow. Um, you know, so we know, uh, where some boxes may be that may be unmaintained. Um, I've noticed some properties out there I've come across, 
um, bluebird boxes. And I wonder, is anyone maintaining this? I'm not sure if anyone's cleaning it every year, for example, just the bare minimum maintenance. Um, there is a video I linked here to how to set up bird boxes in Ontario, or you can just search that term there. Feeder watching. Oh my, there's a lot of forms of birding. Feeder watch, I'm not going to get deep into it because I talked a little bit about that earlier. Look up their site. Uh, flap was mentioned earlier by Jackson. So this is about the bird strikes. Hawk watch, I mentioned briefly earlier, Niagara Peninsula, Hawk, Hawk Cliff. Christmas bird count. Of course, I talked about that a little earlier. Bird banding. So this is a big thing with some people. Uh, and it's really interesting because you get to be up close to the birds. So if you're ever interested in bird banding, which is the process of catching birds and mist nets and basically identifying them, putting a tag on them. So in case they're ever caught again, someone can register where they were from, where they ended up, that kind of thing. You can talk to the Haldeman Bird Observatory. They're always looking for volunteers or Bruce Peninsula Bird Observatory much further north. Um, but there is a small documentary about it. I'd recommend you check out because it's only three and a half minutes. So yeah, it's a quick, quick um, watch. All right, birding tools, which I am going to fly through pretty quickly here. Field guides. I think it's pretty straightforward, but I'm going to call it one of them here. The Peterson field guide listed here. I specifically listed just to show you that there are field guides that are specific to niches of birding. So this one's the bird sounds of North America. And you might wonder how can those be shown very well in uh, printed book form. It's actually really good. They work out a really neat language behind how to talk about um, sounds of birds and songs of birds. Um, using a very specific language and is a very neat and innovative um, index to it for looking up bird sounds. eBird, I've mentioned earlier, this is your one-stop st uh, shop for listing all the birds that you see when you're out or in your backyard. You can make lists. You can keep track of all the lists you've ever had all your life in here. Um, you can upload your old pen and paper ones if you want to. You'll of course have to transcribe them, but you know you can go back as far as you want to. Um, and uh, it is a really neat one-stop shop for this. It's really what got modern, more modern birding going is the ability to keep track and know what you've seen, what you haven't seen, and more importantly, getting alerts about birds you haven't seen showing up in the area or rare birds showing up in the area. Um, recently, they added this trip report feature, which is really neat. I gave uh, I give a couple examples here. One, the Hamilton CBC, I made use of it for that because it makes a great trip report. I did a recent trip to Allegheny uh, National Forest and I made a trip report to it. It's kind of a living document, so it's going to be edited as we go. But um, it allowed me to understand, you know, what all I saw and all my lists and I could write down all the notes I wanted because they have a narrative section. You can write a report. Um, you can write all of your handwritten notes down if you want. Merlin, and we're going to talk a little more about this later. This is an amazing app that came out recently. Um, and actually, maybe I will go into that section of it now about how Merlin works, excuse me, under the hood. This is an app that has been developed for a long time now. It started with just photos where you could basically upload a photo to this app and it will try to guess what bird it is. And it's pretty accurate generally. It'll give you, give you ideas. You can even do things like it has a, a interface where if you don't have a photo, you can say, okay, it was Robin size. It had these colors. Uh, it did these things and it will try to give you hints of what could be doing that. So even if you don't have a photo, really neat, but they've been working for a few years now on this bird song call stuff. It's working really well. And I've seen people out in the field using this. I've seen people I'm pretty sure aren't birders out there using this. Um, I was up in Bruce Peninsula this year uh, in, uh, what is he, Johnson Harbor, um, just driving down a road. And there was only like one other person on that road and they were holding up their phone to a tree. And I'm like, I know exactly what they're doing. They're using Merlin to learn what's singing there. And it was probably a red start knowing that area. Um, I'm going to switch to them for a moment here to behind the scenes of Merlin, because I'm actually an annotator for Merlin. Um, we're gonna go to US Canada here. This is for those of us who are volunteers who help train the system on what bird is what. And we're given these things called reference annotations. You might be able to see here, I might blow up the text a little bit so it's a little bigger, but let's say I go here and this is a reference um, for us annotators. What does a a good annotation of an oven bird sound like. So let's play this and hopefully the audio is gonna work.
So let's go back here for a second. Notice there's a little box over this, and this is us annotators go in and we make these boxes over the actual song of the oven bird so that when a recording is done and turned into spectrograph, what Merlin actually does is it goes and compares visually what's going on in an audio file. Oh, this one's a real small one. Let's go to something a little more obvious. Uh, we'll go to a training file. That one's, yeah, let's go here. That one's a small one. So here's a real quiet one. We also have things called background, not bird. So it's important for Merlin to know when there's no, no bird in a recording as well. Um, but yeah, here's something we do. We do that so that when, and if, you, if you've used the Merlin app, you can recognize this because it actually prints this on the screen as you're using it. And this is how we've been training the system. So here's like ticks from an oven bird, for example. Oh, and then a full song. Oh, right, this one. So sometimes um, oven birds get into very ornery songs. So that's a rather extended one, but let me see if I can find a chip. There we are, chip note. And so these recordings are sourced from eBird itself. I can actually go and look at what eBird checklist this came off of. This is from Shaf uh, Thatcher's Pinnacles, New York, United States. It was, what was the date? Sunday, 2018. Um, these were actually randomly selected, but recently we've been given the option to be able to opt certain recordings in. If one of us is using Merlin and it doesn't recognize something, we can take our recording and add it to the system. Or if someone else tells us, hey, Merlin didn't know what this was, we can actually bring it into the system. Um, but that's a little bit, I wanted to show this because this is kind of cutting edge stuff, stuff that you could volunteer for if you're really into bird song. Uh, but also just very interesting, I think, to a lot of people who are interested in technology and how uh, the machine learning works uh, for this. So let's go back into our presentation for a bit here, because I know time is of the essence. Zenocanto is another site you can upload your recordings to. I'm not going to say much more about it, but there's a lot of recordings there that you can source if you're looking to just hear more of a certain species um, or there is an option to upload stuff there that you're not sure what it is and post to a forum saying, hey, can anybody help me identify this particular recording? Although with Merlin these days, it may not be as necessary. Nestwatch, um, this is an interesting little site that you can do. Um, basically, it teaches you all about nest watching. This is part of a breeding bird survey, kind of. Um, they make you go kind of through a little course on like ethics and how you approach nests and how you find nests and things like this. It's something I've participated in the past. Um, definitely in the wrong time of year now, but if you're interested in trying to find nests and document them, this is a pretty neat website and app to do that with. They also will teach you about birdhouses, although it is very US focused. So when you're going to the section about like what birdhouses can I build for my region, you're gonna have to use the nearest New York or Ohio county basically to identify yourself this is brand new as of like last week bird migration of uh, bird migration explorer um go to bird migration explorer.org they um basically give animated um not videos, I guess they're just animated diagrams of the migration of various species over the time, over the year, using examples of tagged birds from MODIS and other programs that actually have birds with trackers on them that are tracked by VHF and other types of towers. Um, some might, I don't know if there are any other satellite tracked or just from um, what they, there's some recorders that they have to retrieve from the birds after that are based on sunlight and things like that. So they know what latitude and longitude they're at, but um, basically using all that data to actually show what the migration of individual species look like. And you can actually watch it throughout the year and see what it looks like. So the changing ranges and things like that, it's very interesting to look at. Birdcast, this is very US focused, but for some reason, Grimsby's in the alert section, Grimsby, Ontario, so we can sort of use it. This was from last Friday, but um, you can basically sign up for alerts that there's going to be a lot of migration happening in a particular night. So if you can go back in your backyard, listen for birds at night going overhead, maybe even do the nocturnal flight count type stuff. Or you just want to know that next morning, maybe there's going to be a lot of birds showing up because the forecast said so. Um, speaking of which, a lot of it uses data from 
um, weather uh, satellites and stations and things like that, and websites like this, Venture Sky, can be used to kind of predict where birds might be because it'll show wind at various elevations. So you'll notice I've given an example here that you can choose um, where uh, the wind would be. So what's the what's the wind like 2,000 meters above, um, for example, versus what is it like down low? Because maybe there's some drafts up above that are different that might. Um, be better for certain migrating species like raptors, for example, but maybe the low winds are in a different direction because that can be a thing or different intensity. So there's a lot that can be done with Venture Sky. Um, just go explore it if you're really into weather and predicting where birds might go and show up. Birds of the World, this is a resource that's basically like the Wikipedia for birds, um, but you do have to pay a subscription to get access to all the birds but it's basically an amalgamation of all kinds of journals and academic work done on all kinds of species. So if you want a real deep dive into every single species, this is something you can subscribe to to get access to. iNaturalist, I mean, just briefly touch upon it. It's an app and a website. You can upload not just birds, but all kinds of other things. You'll notice that I use it mostly not for birds, but you can put your birds in there too. Uh, and it, it can be helpful for identification or just documenting um, as well. Discord I mentioned earlier, hamiltonnature.org slash discord. You can join our discord, which we have we have links to the Ontario field ornithologists, uh, Ontario rare bird alert, places like that are linked in there. So you can go to the other discords. This is, of course, a text chat slash there's options for voice and video calls, but really most people do it for text chat uh, for both on their computer and on the app in the field if you have a data plan. Uh, and you can keep track of, for example, the Ontario bir Rare Bird Alert is all about like rare birds. Um, you can also, um, what was I just thinking? Oh yeah, yeah. And also the Hamilton Naturalist Club uh, Discord is just for discussion. Like it's COVID has kind of separate a lot of people. So you can just post in whatever you're seeing out there. Um, we have channels for certain patches for birding, um, but we also have stuff in there that doesn't have to do with birding. It can be herps or... Uh, leps, uh, so butterflies, moths, whatever, mammals, sightings, you can do that. You can share that there. Um, but yeah, they're all linked at hamiltonnature.org slash discord. That's the link to the invite for the Hamilton one. And then inside the Hamilton one, we have links to other ones. Um, you can quickly look up on Reddit and Facebook. There are lots of groups that are like, what's this bird? So those exist, just so you know, all, all about birds. You might have seen that mentioned earlier in the presentation. This is a site I frequently go to when I'm just like, what's the song of this particular bird? And how do people tend to describe its range? Because when producing the podcast, sometimes uh, I want to check what other people say about ranges and habitat and stuff like that, because I don't want to be like, oh, yellow warblers are always in, you know, prairies and that's it or something like that. I don't want to say something like that. And then it turns out they're also in mountainous regions and we just don't have that around here, that kind of thing. Uh, so I want to often fact check myself with that. Speaking of podcasts, here's a quick list of some of them. Uh, just checking time. So I'll spend about a minute on this. Bird Note is a quick daily podcast. It's short. And it's usually just about like one bird species or one aspect of birding. Bird Banter is more of a interview podcast run by Ed Pullen. Um, he interviews all kinds of people about kind of their biography of birding, I think is more his approach. The Science of Birds is kind of, you know, a deep dive into science of particular aspects of birds. It's really interesting. Like there's an episode about nesting, for example, episodes about song, episodes about migration, that kind of thing. And by the way, I put your podcast here just because it's not that hard to make one if you got a lot of interest in particular things. Um, even if you don't know a lot, maybe you're good at interviewing people or maybe you're good at researching. Could be interesting. Casual Birder Podcast, that's Susie. She's in the UK, so it's more UK focused, but she does have some content for North America and it's about casual birding. It's about not being, you know, necessarily a person chasing birds, um, twitching as they call it out there, or uh, chasing rarities is more what I mean, or heavy listing or anything like that. It's about like the day-to-day -day, um, type stuff. Hannah and Eric go birding. They're all about their trips and um, they're, what they've seen in their birding world in the West Coast. Uh, I believe they're in Washington State. American Birding Podcast that's run by the ABA, the American Birding Association. That'll give the weekly uh, rare bird reports for around North America and interviews with various people in the birding world. The Warblers is kind of their Canadian equivalent with Birds Canada. And uh, they don't do the weekly reports of rare birds or anything because the ABA podcast already does that, but uh, they're doing more like Canadian focused 
topics uh, in birding. And songbirding is my own, which I do in the in the field recorded birding. Um, I was mentioned YouTube. There's a lot of stuff out there. I'm not going to cover much just because time. Um, Twitch, which I wanted to definitely make sure I mention here because I've been experimenting with doing bird streams. So there's so many other people that are doing this in a really neat way. So I'll give some examples here in the top left. We've got Louis D. Lyon, who is doing a bird feeder. Uh, got hummingbirds all the time going on there. Um, on the top right is Liz uh, under the handle I Paint Burbs. She's actually a Twitch partner, which means she's, you know, um, making partially a living off of doing this. Um, generally is what that means, has a very big audience. Um, she does her artwork, bird artwork, while showing a feeder and while chatting with people who are in her chat. So that's really fun. And in the center is Dr. WD-40. He is in Space Coast, Florida. He does a mix of birding and um, space shuttle launch. Um, like he will live stream on space shuttle launch nearby and metal detecting on beaches. And he is a professor of, of biology, uh, but biological science, biological something, but yeah, it's a professor of biology basically is what I'll go with. But he, so he knows his stuff really well and um, he's really fun streams. Uh, bottom left, Seth Lee. Uh, Seth, he's in um, uh, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Uh, he does one or two streams a week and he just does birds. He goes out, it's great. It's really fun to watch. Uh, he broadcasts from out in the field, whatever he sees through his camera scope, et cetera. And the bottom right, California Burbs, who is in Altascadero, California, I believe it is. And uh, it's always um, Kamal and Suzanne are always broadcasting their backyard and all the different drama that goes on there. It's a really fun chat, too. They're really got a good community chatting there all the time and um, all kinds of interesting stuff going on there. And I just wanted to make sure to give a shout out to them. So. Conclusion, birding can be whatever you want it to be. So don't get overwhelmed by all these options. I just want to make sure that, you know, you can see there's a lot of things that could be possible and called birding, um, but feel free to carve out your own niche. I certainly have done that myself a few times. And, um, but wait, is there more? I mean, you know, throw in the chat if there's something I'm missing here or a tool that wasn't mentioned, but uh, let's go over to some questions and things like that. Um, Jackson, you got anything for me? <laughs> well, Rob, I've just learned that for some reason the chat is disabled, which I did oh, not no. know was a thing. I thought I enabled it tonight. There is a Q&A section. Though, um, it? There is a Q&A section for sure. And there are right. a couple of things on there. So if we're recording, so yes, yeah. we are recording this and hoping to upload it onto YouTube. Cool. Uh, but Kevin MP wants to know is there any strap that holds both binoculars and camera so that's one question on there for sure probably i remember i looked into this and there was ones i just don't know what the model would be uh but there probably is uh i just don't know the quality of it also <laughs> um and so what i wanted to know though um was you know what what excites you about these advancements in technology but then conversely mm. What worries you about it? You okay, know, like, so, now we're able to do so much and learn so much. So yeah, what what do you think about those two elements of this? Okay, yeah, that's I could definitely go on about that. But let's start with we've seen a lot more young people get into birding a lot quicker. Um, partly because I think social media has a lot to do with this. I mean, years ago I used to share. I used to be one of the first people to show bird photos on Twitter. It was before Twitter even had photos as an option. It was always links to photos basically at the beginning. But that's really taken off now. Like, uh, if I was doing that now, I'd be drowned in the sea of birding photos out there. There's just so much. And I think a lot of younger people are seeing that in their social media. Uh, and really just anyone. I, I, I shouldn't just call it younger people, but I have heard consistently from a lot of people that are, like, surprised at how many younger people do birding. But I think it's also that the fact that you can now very inexpensively get photos of birds that are really good, like identifiable even if they're not going to be hung in your wall, they're at least, oh, wow, I can see that close up and I can understand that that's a different bird than I get in my backyard. Um, that's interesting to people. It can really get them into, oh, maybe I can do this because my friend did this. Um, you know, get them excited in that way. Um, the downsides of the technology thing is sometimes you can probably take a lot of things for granted. Um, you could, um, you know, forget that, you know, you're documenting living creatures, you, you know, might, uh, there is like the whole ethics behind, for example, and we've heard problems with uh, people baiting birds. Um, so that is the process of setting out like live mice on a, on a 
country road to get owls to come down and pick up um, uh, pick up the, the running mice that you let go so you can get a good photo. Uh, we've seen that over the years. Um, we've seen um, a lot of cases of people using record ear, you know, agitate birds so they can come out so you can get photos of them. Um, things like that uh, is, you know, can be worrying. Um, let me see what else. Um, sometimes the accessibility of, and this is the catch 22, the accessibility of birding for at the angle of like reportage. So if a rare bird appears in the area and it's breeding bird, um, the chances of if that bird gets reported and then ends up um, broadcast everywhere that, oh my God, there's, you know, finally the uh, prothonotary warblers return to Southern Ontario at this one spot. And that one spot gets flooded with people and the prothonotary warbler never comes back because it was like, well, it was full of people. <laughs> Yeah, that 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 can be a concern, but at the same time, um, that also opens up an opportunity that if that's found there, uh, someone can come in and help protect that. Because um, now, you know, the odds of any uh, offspring surviving of any given bird is usually very low. Um, this is why, you know, they lay nests with five eggs, uh, sometimes multiple times a year. Um, two birds just have to replace themselves with another two birds to keep a stable population. But over the lifetime might have 20 eggs, 40 eggs, 60 eggs. Um, so we know the survival rate is low as it is with people coming in and knowing that something's there, they can raise that odds a lot. Um, so there is the upside there quite a bit. So it can be a catch 22 very much. Yeah. Um, I mean, <clears throat> we saw that when, was it the, northern no is it the boreal owl that oh, showed right. up at 50 yeah. point um and <laughs> yeah someone posted it to ebird thinking it was a saw wet owl and then yeah. all these folks were able to see it and realize well that photo is not a saw wet that's a yeah. boreal and they posted the exact location now i can go right to it and then that area was like inundated with folks yeah. for weeks yeah which then puts a threat on onto the northern saw wet owls which are there Yes, that's a good point. And like, I've seen examples of this, for example, there is a, you know, some conflicts come up in places like New York City, where, um, why am I blanking on the name of the big park there? Why am I blanking on that? Um, Central Park? Central Park, of course, thank you. Central Park birding is a big thing. Um, but um, whenever an owl is found there, that owl uh, is probably going to be stared at by a lot of people for a long time. And that can be great because it's very, so here's where some of the balance and nuance comes in. That can be great because we'll get a lot of people interested in birding because now I can go see an owl and not necessarily anybody's trying to harm it or anything like that. We don't necessarily know whether it's going to be harmful or not, but at the same angle, there's going to be um, the aspect that like the great horned owl, if it's a great horned owl, for example, is not threatened in any way, but the great horned owl um, living in central park might be threatened. So it's that balance between like, okay, yeah, if people harass this, it may not be in Central Park anymore, but it, it's really safe right now. Um, so I'm not saying people should harass it more, but sometimes there are, you know, conversations get into, well, you know, this is going to detriment, you know, it starts sounding like it's going to be a big detriment to the species, but really the species is fine. It's going to be more your local bird is not going to be there anymore. Um, yeah. So um, So that's where some of the balance nuance can come from. Uh, so Rob, your, go ahead. your audio and visual is lagging quite a bit. I just thought okay. I'd share that with you just as we're wrapping up here. Yep. Um, you know, that's kind of the same as um, the short-eared owl that showed up in Tommy Thompson Park in 2022, which I think was then found dead after so many people showed up to take photographs of it. So you're right. There is that balance. And that's all the same reasons why we're, we mm -hmm. host things like this and why we want to get more awareness. I think yeah, we want more people out there. And we want more eyes on it. And for example, uh, just tonight, we were able to get over 3,010 folks um, onto the Hamilton Nature Instagram page, which was great. So nice work, everybody. <laughs> so, awesome. you know, we do want more eyes and ears out there, but we do want to ensure that those who are out there are being respectful because, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing population decline in, declines in, in a variety of different uh, species. Um, 
So exactly. yeah, having that awareness is great and hopefully everyone's keeping safe out in the field and will continue to do so. An anonymous attendee asks, is there a particular Nest Box camera that you can recommend? Not a particular one. Uh, it's not something I'm too deep into. Um, uh, let me think. There's quite a few Nest Box camera feeds on both Twitch and YouTube though. So you might, if you go searching through those places, you might be able to find someone to ask. Um, so I'll do that nice thing where I don't know, but I can point you to people who might know <laughs> if you if search out there. Um, yeah, it, go and use those resources because there are people who are glad to talk to you about that who regularly broadcast their cameras. And do you have any uh, advice for Nest Box watching in terms of ethics and safety around the birds? You oh, know, yeah. Like so Nest Box, like if you're just talking about without cameras and Nest Box watching. So the Nest Watch um, thing I mentioned earlier, that app and website, um, maybe I'll see if I can pull it up here just so you can see. Um, it's Birds of the World. That's what I'm talking about. Nest Watch. There we go. So their website actually takes you through a little bit of a course about um, nest watching. Um, now nest boxes are a little different than just nests out in the wild. Nests out in the wild, one of the things I can give as a tip that's you may not have thought of this is leave the nest from a different angle than you approached it at, for example, because otherwise you're creating a path for a particular predator it might take. So predator might go, oh, well, somebody wore, wore this down here. So I wanna, wanna see what's going on. Um, whereas you just go there at one angle and leave at a different angle, you don't create that double track. Um, nest boxes for bluebirds, for example, um, watching them fairly regularly is fine until they, um, once there's eggs, uh, I've been usually told, you know, basically give them the 14 days or so, let them hatch. You don't really need to check up on eggs. Um, generally, you're fine. Um, once they're hatched, usually it's fine checking fairly regularly until they're a little bit older. Once they get in that age where they could fledge, you want to be careful about opening the box because they might freak out and fledge prematurely, get out early. Also, tree swallow parents get more and more agitated and aggressive the older <laughs> the young get. So you will be dive bombed if it's tree swallows <laughs> and attacked. And I'm sure, Jackson, you have had that happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, definitely, yes. Um <clears throat> And I think my last question, and again, if anyone does have any questions, you put them in the Q&A because I'm not sure why the chat was disabled. I thought it was enabled this whole time. Yeah. Um, so we'll get that situated next time. Um, I've seen quite a bit of discussion, and this occurred on like the Advanced Birding in Ontario page, that folks were noticing that people were um, submitting sightings on checklists or saying, you know, I, 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 I heard, you know, a cerulean warbler and Merlin verified it, Yeah. but they didn't actually see Ooh, the bird yeah. itself, but they only relied on Merlin telling them what they heard. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts or comments? Um, about <laughs> it really that? depends on the bird. Um, yeah, Merlin's pretty good, but it's not necessarily infallible. Uh, there are cases of mimics. Uh, let's just pull up the Merlin thing excuse me, just so people know what we're talking about. There are cases where birds mimic each other. That can be an issue. Um, I'm not necessarily talking about cat birds and mockingbirds and typical ones. Usually what happens with those species is they ramble on and on. They make all kinds of sounds. So it's, not, oh, I got a tree swallow. Now I got a robin. Now I got, you know, it's obviously you don't have all those things in one bird. Um, but what can happen are certain species like uh, you heard that unusual oven bird one where it just kind of rambled on a little bit. Um, you can have red starts doing a bit of mimicry. I do actually have that um, songbirding episode coming up next week uh, where there's a red, a female red start singing something that sounds a lot like a common yellow throat. Just a little bit here and there, you know, one song here and there, but it's there. Uh, so it can have that. Um, in my Twitch chat, um, someone said white-eyed vireos are also quite the mimic. That's another thing. We don't get many white-eyed vireos here on though, unfortunately, but, um, <laughs> they, they can also be that, um, the, let me think another good example would be blue jay. Um, they can sometimes mimic just one species at a time. So the whole red-tailed hawk scream they'll do around here. But if you go further north, you might hear broadwing hawk scream from them instead. 
I have heard them also make sounds that sound like, I don't know why, but um, red-bellied woodpecker, which in the winter up there would be less common. So I'm thinking, oh, I got a red-bellied woodpecker. No, it's a blue jay just making red-bellied woodpecker sounds for who knows what reason. So sometimes the visual needs to be there to confirm it. But often, you know, if it sounds like a cerulean warbler, you probably just want to stick around and see if you can confirm it visually in some way, because it should be interesting to you. Now, if you recorded it and didn't realize what you had until later, you know, that's a time to decide, am I going to go back there? Am I going to share this with someone else to go back there? Um, you know, depending on the rarity level of it, that can also be a debate too. I certainly have had to, to you know, balance that sometimes as well too because you don't want somewhere flooded. I did have at least one case this year where something on my breeding bird atlas was like, yeah, if I told people this, they'd all show up here and this bird would leave. So I can't do it, you know? Yeah. So, I was chatting with someone who's been doing some banding on a private property um, um, with permission and with the legal banders. And they had three Connecticut warblers Wow! just in the last couple of weeks and have not wanted to, uh, I think only now they're starting to upload their checklist about it because yeah. they, yeah, didn't want people showing up on this private property where the public can't go uh, in order to track this bird down. I know I've tried to hide owl sightings uh, on social media or on um, on eBird or, mm -hmm. or waiting for a few weeks until we I knew they were gone, especially with snowies who like to hang out like right on the ground. Right, um, and because, yeah. You never know what people are going to do if they show up at these sites. I should mention as well, the OFO has been trying out a rare bird ambassador program. I don't know if you heard about that. Oh. Where Okay, so where um, volunteer would come forward and say, well, we know about this rare bird sighting in this location. Someone will volunteer to basically kind of manage people at that location, especially if it's on private property or near private property, to basically discuss with landowners to make sure that everyone's allowed there and that there are terms on conditions of viewing a bird. Uh, for example, um, I think this was spurred on because of that a hawk owl that showed up years ago um, in, I can't remember, it was Oshawa, Scarborough, somewhere out there. Um, it was just a, it was a field day out there. Like people are just disturbing a residential neighborhood in droves. Like people lined up up and down the street in this residential neighborhood with cameras and, you know, it's like paparazzi in your backyard kind of thing. Um, and uh, so that was I'm trying to remember what birds, but I haven't really been tracking like much what's going on with rare birds lately uh, in Ontario. But I, I've seen a lot of examples of this being used, though, this new ambassador program. So I think that's like a good step forward where now we have, you know, the OFO has decided to come forward and say, OK, we'll organize a volunteer thing to interact with landowners. We don't have situations where birders are getting a bad rap because a couple of people decided, oh, I can get a better photo if I hop over this fence or, you know, if I cut these branches right here, I can see it better, that kind of thing. Um, so to, to have that kind of dialogue and to turn, I think their goal was not only to turn, you know, the the situation around as in not having birders have a bad rap, but also make it a pleasant experience for the landowners slash um, people who live in a particular area. Cause it's not always landowners, you know, someone could be renting a place um, or otherwise occupying a spot and you, you know, need to respect that. So they don't expect to have like paparazzi in their backyard 24 seven. So, you know, uh, so that there's a lot of, and part of the problem, and this is a good problem somewhat, is there's a lot of birders in Southern Ontario. It's a huge area for birding. Colleen um, mentioned it also helps eliminate elitism. Yes. Which is a whole too. other conversation we could be having. It, because it I know is. That, I know that conversation can go in a few different directions, depending on the topic. Yeah, um, gatekeeping can be a huge thing in any hobby, but it can be especially bad in birding sometimes. This is partly why I like doing this kind of presentation, just showing there's all kinds of niches, there's all kinds of things you could be doing. And maybe some people will be like, yeah, it's not birding, but you know what, that's up to you. Um, and if it involves birds and you're really helping, and especially when you're doing things like mentorship and stewarding things, um, that's super helpful. Yeah, because we don't want to be turning new folks away from the hobby right yeah. we want to be welcoming to people and if they start realizing that certain uh, avenues are going to be something that um they don't feel safe or comfortable in then they're just going to walk away from it or they're going to 
mm-hmm. they're going to keep doing it, but they're going to be doing it on their own. And how does that help harbor a community um, and, and, and grow the love for it? Which is why I'm so happy that you've been uh, here today to kick off our bird study group season. So Rob, thank you so much. Is there mm-hmm. any final thing that you want to cover tonight um, before we, we end as it is nine o'clock? By the way, I should put up the last screen here, just so all my contact info. So I am also, I, I do do some of the live birding stuff on Twitch. Um, now, as someone who does Twitch, I actually do some traditional stuff on Twitch. So I do do some, play some 40 and 30 year old games on it more often than I do birding because getting out and field and birding is a complicated thing to live stream. There's a lot of gear involved and data plans and things like that. Uh, and weather has to cooperate and my schedule has to cooperate. So this is why I shout out other people more than myself on that, because there are people who do that exclusively or more often at least, um, cause we want to build that pie a little more on stuff like that. So if any of that's even remotely interesting to you, let me know, cause we can help with some advice on doing that or podcasting as well too, because, um, if you search birding for podcasts, there's quite a few out there. Actually, a lot of them are defunct though, because a lot of people just put out one or two and then they're done. Um, so anything we can do to support that, um, or just in general, your birding journey, like I, the Hamilton Naturalist Club bird studies group should be there for that. So, um, it would be helpful to know where maybe the club is falling short. Maybe there's something the club can be doing to help there. I know we're getting like in-person events going soon, especially field events would help a ton, like getting out there with a, nothing helps more your identification skills than getting out there with a mentor who can tell you an answer right away of what bird you're seeing. Merlin helps a ton so that you can do a lot of the stuff on your own, especially people who may not feel safe joining groups or going out and meeting other people they don't know. Um, But if um, you can feel comfortable to join a large group of people and get led around in a fairly public place, um, learning from a mentor is a huge thing. Um, They can really get you going, especially give you the tools to work on your own a little more or maybe mentor others. So I think that's just, you know, the goal we should be aiming for in the here, here. bird study group. Yes. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, with that said, where, where can we find you birding this fall? What's, oh, what's, boy. <laughs> what's a, what's a spot? Not, not necessarily exactly when and where, Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, but, but what, a idea. what's a good spot that, that, that Rob Porter can share with the community. Oh. Before that is a good question. Cause I am all over the place. Ten tendency wise for birding. Um, Valens is a place that I think sometimes is underrated. So I'll go in there quite a bit. Um, I enjoy it because uh, there's just so much different habitat there. Um, Valens conservation area. Um, I often do go up to the Bruce to visit family, but also go birding. Um, so Bruce Peninsula, Bruce County, a lot of great birding up there. Fall is going to be, you know, a bit more hit and miss because, you know, we got the confusing fall warblers, um, not much singing. There's a lot of insects out there singing instead, but um, not much singing. So it's a little more difficult of an endeavor, but um, you know, it's a good question. Like I, I am very these days kind of reactionary to my birding, <laughs> just build it into other things I'm doing. If I happen to be on a particular direction, well, then I'll go birding there. But I did want to say, I mentioned earlier, I did that trip to Allegheny um, and this is something I'll throw out there that maybe in a year or two, I can do a, like a trip presentation because I'm going to be going back there a couple more times. And I think it would be interesting to share with people what I'm finding there, because uh, this is something that took me years to kind of realize. And a lot of people may not realize that's a place that is a lot like what Southern Ontario once was when it was all forested It is still entirely forest down there. And it's only three hours of a drive. Where's Alle- Allegheny Mountains? Where is that? Allegheny where National Forest, or Allegheny State Park's only two and a half hours from here, um, and that's in New York State. This you know southern part is New York State uh, in the the mainland part. Pennsylvania is where I went, and it was amazing, and it wasn't that far of a drive. Um, and there's places there where you can be somewhere where there's no one for miles, um, if that's your thing. That also means there's a lot of birds. Um, I got whippoorwills. Um, I got lots of warblers, uh, lots of stories of it now, but I'll be going back in the spring. Uh, I got lots of recordings, of course. That's, that's partly why I was there, but I'll be going back in the spring. And I know a friend there who has a farm that I'll be going and hanging out at that farm and seeing what birds is, are on their mountain. Cause they have a farm with a mountain and I have access to it. So very yeah, cool stuff to check out. I can, I can already see Colleen Riley booking a trip with the pippets down there. Yeah, exactly. Um, now that the border right, is, this is the other thing. Now that the border is back open up after COVID, this is partly why I was like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm 
going somewhere new because last two years we've been kind of locked into Southern Ontario, right? I mean, Southern Ontario without the border being open is kind of a, it's a funnel trap, right? You can't go South. It's hard to go North because the Bruce Peninsula just ends. So you have to go East and then North and then around, like there's, you, you can't get around very easily for several years. So <laughs> and it sounds like Allegheny is the same distance away as Bruce Peninsula is exactly. as well. So. That, that's also was a factor. And so it was one of those things that people don't realize, you know, if you, if you start ignoring international borders and you're <laughs> planning. Um, well, Rob, thank you so much for all of your insight tonight and for, yeah, just being open to talk about new technology. I know that that is a scary thing for a lot of folks, myself included. Mm-hmm. I, I hear about Twitch and it's just like, ah, it sounds like a cool world to get into, but I haven't even explored yeah. it yet. Uh, but you help you help people want to, you know, explore new things. Um, and if it means learning, then we're all for it. So thanks for kicking off our season uh, by being our first special guest this year. And uh, I look forward to having you back. And when is the Christmas bird count this year? Do you know? Is it the 26th again? It's always the 26th. Always, the always Hamilton. The 26th. Um, I'll have to remember what we did for the Flambro because last year was the first year of it. And we just put it in a particular date. And it's not, I, I don't remember if it was a set date or a set like last Friday of the year or something like that. But um, we'll cover that in a future yeah. presentation. Yeah, well, if it's not uh, next month with Bob Curry as the special guest, we'll definitely bring you back in uh, November to talk all about the December birding bird counts that are yeah. coming up. Okay, awesome. so one thing I just thought of, I'll throw out there a very small yeah. winter and maybe to some extent fall, but winter is a great time to start birding if you're new to it because the leaves are gone, so the birds are exposed. You don't need to worry about what is that bird I'm hearing everything's fairly bright because there's snow on the ground, easy photography, yep. limited number of species. You're not going to go overwhelmed. So just throwing that out there. <laughs> and then when you become like an intermediate, then it's easier to find rarities because exactly. yeah, you get to know all of the, uh, the commoners. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Good tip. All right. Thanks, Rob. Well, um, on behalf of the Hamilton Nationalist Club, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for being here tonight. Um, folks are saying thanks in the in the Q and A. So thank you very much for your kind words, Mimi, Colleen, Peter, and everyone else who's still here. Um, stay safe out there, and we will see you again soon. So until next time, adios. Thanks again, Rob. No problem. See you.